Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are right now. Um, my name is Laura Schramm, and I'm the Director of Professional Development at Rackham Graduate School. Um, we have two amazing student panelists who will be joining us today. Um, one of them, we are having a little trouble with their um, audio and video. They, they had to log out, and hopefully they'll be logging back in. But because we only have an hour together and we have a little bit of a presentation at the start, we are going to get started. So the goals of today's session are for us to just share a couple insights from the scholarship about graduate education on common challenges that folks face in transitioning to a graduate program. And we also are going to hear from a couple of experienced international students about how they successfully navigated their transitions. And um, I'll be putting out some questions to them, but we also hope that you all who are here um, will feel comfortable uh, asking questions of our panelists too. So if you have questions about transitioning, this is um, the place to be. So Julie Passelt is a leading scholar in graduate education, and I'll be using her conceptual model of graduate education to frame our discussion today. Um, she has a model of the common challenges that graduate students face in their time in grad school. So today I'm going to walk through the um, common academic challenges that people face transitioning to graduate school. Next, I'll go over sociocultural challenges, which result um, from conflicts between our social and cultural backgrounds and the social and cultural context um, that we're in in our graduate studies. And lastly, I'll discuss two psychosocial challenges. And psychosocial challenges are about the interrelation between social factors on the one hand and our individual thoughts and behaviors. So I want to note that these are complex challenges and there may be combinations of academic and sociocultural and psychosocial domains, but for simplicity's sake, I'm going to talk about these three categories separately. Um, so first is academic challenges. Students often report that the academic challenge in graduate school is unlike anything they faced in their previous studies. And this can be very stressful for students who've gotten here because they have always been high academic achievers. Um, so the academic challenges really are rooted in subject matter learning. Um, students have to develop and demonstrate the ability to engage in original field specific research. And often it's the first time that we're not just learning about our fields, but being asked to create um, an original contribution to the field. And students are expected to master their field or for doctoral students even advance the field once they've achieved mastery. So it's really stretching our capacities as students and scholars, academically speaking. So there have been many studies of graduate students at a single point in time, and um, Dr. Passelt's framework is grounded in those past studies. No scholar or group had previously conducted until very recently a multi-year study to track across time how students experience their graduate programs. And Rackham implemented such a study four years ago now, the Michigan Doctoral Experience Survey, or MDES is what it's referred to. Um, so we are in the fourth year of the study. We're past the midpoint, and it'll span five years when it's complete. And the data from the study really illustrate what scholars already suspected about the challenges of transitioning to graduate school. So this is a finding from the study that relates to academic challenges. Our Rackham research on doctoral students finds evidence of decreased sense of self-efficacy due to the transition to graduate school. So what is self-efficacy? Self-efficacy measures students' confidence in their ability to learn and become independent scholars in their discipline. So we find evidence that the subject matter learning challenges negatively impact students' sense of self-confidence in their ability to be independent scholars. And this reflects what Dr. Passell argues that the academic challenges are significant and very normal in your first year of graduate school. And you may feel initially like you're less confident than you thought you were coming into graduate school as you kind of tackle these new academic challenges. 
So next I'm going to go over sociocultural challenges which result from conflict between our internal states and the social and cultural context we're in in graduate studies. So um, there are often conflicting norms of challenge and support. And let me explain what that means. Um, US higher education is what uh, scholars refer to as an apprenticeship model where faculty provide and then withdraw support to their students to help build their independence. So um, you may come from a place where um, faculty give tons of constant support um, to you as a scholar in the past. And in graduate studies in the US, faculty, yes, give support, but often withdraw that support in order to help students build their independence, which can be very challenging as um, for new students in particular. There's often um, also conflicting academic and personal values. So some academic values in US higher education are um, sort of publish or perish. In other words, you must publish your scholarship, um, what's called placing students in research focused tenure track jobs. So really the desire by faculty to see their students get jobs in places like where they are teaching. Um, so these are some of the values that you might confront in your home programs and among faculty, whereas personal values might be providing for and spending time with one's family, giving back to one's community, a work-life balance, and so on. And I wanna add that values dissonance is even more pronounced for those from different nations and cultures where our national um, or familial cultures might have very different values than the dominant values um, in academia in the United States. So lastly, there are several psychosocial challenges and that means factors that are at the intersection of our individual mindsets and our social context. Um, so the first one of these is um, a term called imposterism. So imposterism is a phenomenon where um, you believe in yourself as an intellectual fraud, and it often involves someone finding it very difficult to internalize their achievements. Um, many students feel like they're a fraud, that they don't belong, they're the stupidest one in their incoming class, um, they don't know how they got into their programs. This is very common feeling in the transition to graduate school. Um, and second are identity threats. So what are identity threats? This just means students from historically marginalized groups um, can have the additional burden of bias incidents, microaggressions, or a lack of role models who share their social identities. Um, and I wanna note that international students, depending on your departmental context, whether there are lots of other international students or international faculty in your program, um, may also face these identity threats. Um, so I just want to note that that these um, challenges too are interconnected. So the research shows that those from historically marginalized groups tend to also um, report higher frequency of imposterism. So when we don't feel like we belong or when um, we're constantly feeling threatened in our program, it's more common for us to experience a sense of being a fraud and not belonging um, and not being good enough. So there are many challenges from academic to sociocultural um, that can impact our mental and physical health. So Rackham's research on doctoral students finds evidence of diminished mental and physical health due to the transition to graduate school. So on your screen on the left, you can see um, students self-reported mental health, um, both male and female students. The males are the blue line, the females are the green line and physical health kind of mirrors as well, a dip between the first and second year. Um, these effects are consistent across departments and fields of study. So it isn't the case that, um, you know, engineering students uh, are reporting a harder time than social science students. It's really across the board students are reporting lower mental and physical health um, as they transition to graduate school. In addition to overall mental and physical health, the study looked at stress, um, students' self-reports of levels of stress. And again, from years one to three, students do report somewhat more experiences with stress, so higher levels of stress in the transition to graduate school. 
So I want to um, share a couple of resources before we open it up to our amazing panelists. Um, the first time I ever sought the help of a psychological counselor was during my graduate studies, and I was having a very hard time just managing the academic workload and experiencing significant levels of stress more than I ever had previously, and this is normal is what the research shows. Um, and this is the reason why Rackham, Engineering, LSNA, um, all have embedded counselors that you can reach out to. Um, we have a link on the slides that we'll send out to everyone where you can learn about who um, might be a counselor you can reach out to as a resource if you're really experiencing a high level of stress. Um, the University Health Services also has wellness coaching, and these are folks who can help you with um, just you know, a couple of sessions of talking about stress management techniques and how to take care of yourself during what is often a stressful transition. Um, new this year is a Canvas course for all incoming graduate students called Grad School 101. You should all have access to this when you log into your um, Canvas dashboard. And you'll find links to resources on health and wellness, what Rackham can offer you, budgeting and finance. Um, there are also some mini courses, including one on creating a good relationship with your advisor and how to navigate career development as a grad student. And you'll see more and more mini courses that are rolled out um, for you on that Canvas site throughout the year. So that's a great resource that you can kind of log into and find resources anytime um, in a range of areas. And lastly, one of the strategies shown to combat imposterism is to connect with a peer group where you feel safe sharing about your common stressors. And this is especially true for those who move from a different country um, or even a different region of the country where you're, you might be cut off for the very first time from your social and family support networks. Our Rackham sponsored student organizations are Graduate Rackham International who co-sponsored this workshop with Rackham. Also the Rackham student government and students of color of Rackham. There are lots of other great um, organizations at the program and school or college level. So I would urge you to seek out what other organizations might be a good social support network for you. Um, so I'm going to now open it up to our panelists. Um, it looks like is Mohammed here, Kristen and Viva? Oh, yay, here he is. <laughs> I know it sounds like he's had some challenges um, in terms of just getting connected, but um, Mohammed Abdullah is a mechanical engineering graduate student. He'll be one of our panelists. And Viva Vampala is in engineering education research. And the two of them, I'll put a, out a couple of questions to them, but then I encourage folks to. Um, put questions in the chat if you have questions for our panelists. Um, I thought it would be interesting to hear Viva and Mohammed um, just from each of you to tell us a story about your biggest challenge in your first year and how you faced it. Um, Viva, do you want to get us started and then I'll pass it over to Mohammed? Um, sure. Uh, thanks for the introductions, Laura. I, so I, I don't know if this is like the biggest challenge, but it was really, it was, um, it was interesting to navigate. Um, so I did my bachelor's here in North Carolina, and then I transitioned to a program, a master's program at the University of Michigan. Um, and I, and I didn't realize like there's a procedure to change from one university to another when you're on, on an I-20. Um, so every university has its own procedures. And so that's like something that I had to familiarize myself with. So if anyone is like, you know, considering transitioning from um, undergrad to grad or like a master's to PhD, I would just, you know, in advance, look at what your graduate school, the procedure is. It's not really difficult. It's just like, you know, you need to know that it exists and that you need to follow it. Um, so that was something that was like a little, I, I was thrown off by it. Yeah, and we didn't even talk about that as one of the common challenges, but yeah, just navigating the policies, procedures, um, particularly for international students who have additional burdens of worrying about your visa and employment regulations. I think those policies and procedures can be a significant source of transition stress. Yeah, what about you, Mohammed? Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, am I audible? 
Okay, great, perfect. Uh, I'm Mohammed Abdullah, as uh, Laura introduced. Thanks for having me over here. Uh, I'm in PhD in mechanical engineering, but also now I'm a part of like environmental and sciences. And just talking about the biggest challenge, uh, I'm also an international student uh, hailing from Pakistan. And I came over here in 2017 uh, from a master's program in mechanical engineering. And the biggest, uh, or I would say like the first, the foremost challenge was just like getting along in the community. Uh, like the kind of personality that uh, I am like, and particularly coming from like completely different country, different educational system and an entirely different community, different language, culture, and a lot. Of, so it was just kind of a lot for me to take and process and then get along with the, all of the community. So yeah, it was just getting along with the community, finding and connecting with new people and developing and making like meaningful connections, meaningful long-term connections, just beyond the academic, not just with your class fellows, for projects and assignments, but like real life uh, long or like meaningful connections with other people. That was the challenge uh, I faced, I would say. Yeah, and that really drives home the socio-cultural challenges that are, you know, double, triple for our international students. Like, you know, all students face these challenges and yet it's much more significant when you're leaving all your social and family supports. And just like you said, trying to find community both in your program, but also in the wider community in terms of your personal life, whether that might be spiritual community or your interests and hobbies, all of those things are really important. Yeah, Viva, were you going to add something on that? Yeah, I was going to add, um, it's actually very important for you, you just for, for your, you know, academic career or post-academic career to um, really form meaningful connections in general. And I feel like it can be disheartening when in the beginning, you know, you don't feel like you're making as many friends or you don't know as many people. But I feel like over time, you'll realize that like, um, like-minded people you'll come together with them especially like you know joining uh different student orgs on campus was really helpful to me because that's where you can see people with similar values um outside of classes so i would like recommend looking at what's out there based on your interests yeah that's super helpful um for each of you and maybe i'll have muhammad answer first this time what do you wish you had known in your first year uh, yep, that's I'm pretty confident about is about the resources availability for all of the students and particularly for the graduate students. Uh, I don't think there is any segregation between undergrad and grad student, but in general resources available for the students and particularly for your mental health. And also including the physical resources like the recreation building or like uh, other resources from the CAPS. Like one thing in particular I can mention is there's a, like a room in the Pierpont Commons where you can just simply go and relax yourself. There are like UV lights bulbs over there, like particularly for the winters that as it can get a bit depressing over here and the winter is coming. And there are some massage chairs as well. So the CAPS is really an amazing resource over here, I would say. So do look into that. Uh, Laura has already shared go through all of its resources and just go and use it. What about you, Viva? Um, I I love that you brought up CAPS because I there's also this thing called Wolverine Wellness, which I was like going through like a pretty bad breakup in the first semester, which is like, um, you know, tough to navigate with the, everything else. And you can just make an appointment and go talk to someone and it, it's it's completely free I, it's it's also like a lot of people might you know have stigma against like seeking out help for mental health but it's really like just like talking to some talking to like a impartial person and it, it can be very helpful especially when you are really overwhelmed with um school and research and like other life stressors um that's a really great resource and something else that I really found useful was um, you can rent equipment from the recreational um, center. So if even if like, you know, you don't um, you don't have your own like um, hiking stuff or bikes or, you know, whatever outdoor 
outdoor equipment you might need. Um, you can rent them and you can go out. Um, there, Michigan has like really great outdoor spaces. So I think um, those are like great to explore. See, this is amazing because I have been on this campus since 2003 when I started as a grad student and I didn't even know you could rent things from Rexport. So um, I'm learning. I think it's a branch new. of, yeah, it's a branch of Rexport. So just look up like rentals, you mish outdoor or something. And yeah. it'll pop up. I, um, I just found it as you were talking. I was like, I didn't even know about this. So I just put a link in the chat. Yes, that's amazing. Um, what advice would you each give to incoming students? We have lots of them here today. If you could share a piece of wisdom, what would you say? Do you want to start, Viva? Um, I would say don't be afraid to ask for help, um, especially like if you have if you are part of a lab group. Um, I usually found that some of the senior uh, lab members are very helpful in understanding like the norms of your lab culture, uh, the expectations that your uh, professor usually has, that your uh, advisor has for you, um, and just like suggestions on what classes to take. So um, especially with the classes, I think it's really helpful to ask around because um, you really get to know how much work a class is and like you know, if, if the professor teaching it uh, is doing a good job or if it's actually helpful for you to take those classes. So definitely ask around about classes um, and just be like open to meeting people and don't be like afraid to like look stupid because you literally there's like no stupid questions. Just there's just so much you don't know. So <laughs> just anything you have a doubt, just ask. Someone like texted me yesterday and they were like, oh, what is you know, the, um, what is the norm in American culture uh, about gifts? And so like, she um, was a new international student. And I was like, oh, that's a very valid question. Because like, I struggled with it when I first got here, because I was like, it's different from where I come from. So you know, any question that you can have, just like text a friend, they're, they're not gonna, you know, say no. Yeah, I think you just said something that I want to reinforce, and that's, you know, we have our faculty mentors and the graduate coordinators in our program who are all amazing resources, but really do lean on your senior colleagues, whether that's in your program or folks that you connect to through GRIN or other student organizations, because it's often those peer mentors who can really supplement where you feel safe asking questions like that, that might feel like, well, how can I ask my faculty advisor about like gift giving culture in the United States? Like that's a great thing to be able to ask a peer mentor. And if your program has a formal peer mentor um, program, which many departments do, I would encourage you to sign up for that. I think GRIN has a peer mentor program too. If I see <laughs> Mohammed and Viva nodding. So if you feel like just given the challenges of finding new community um, that you haven't been able to find a friend who you can ask these questions to, I'd encourage you to sign up for a peer mentor um, through GRIN or uh, other means available to you because those folks can be such a great resource just in helping getting your questions answered. Mohammed, what about you? What advice would you give? That was great advice. Um, I will just like keep on adding on to that, like just because it was also like the struggle that I had uh, and also like, yeah, kind of like hard steps to go through. I would just say like, take your time, process and just observe and understand and just talk, speak. This would really help you um, go through the stage transitioning stage or challenges, if any. I mean, not necessarily you would have challenge, but if you are having, it's more than normal, even not uh, like for in all the international students, but some, some like even domestic students sometimes feel that. So don't worry about that. And just like try to connect to new people, try to utilize the resources. When you talk to one person, you could just get to know about two other resources. And when you go to the, one of those two resources, you just get to know like two or more. So it's kind of like trickle down tree effect, which you would see the benefit of if you just like start taking one step, no matter how small or how big the step is, just initiate the step. And 
Yeah, I was going to men, uh, mention the mentorship program that Laura had already mentioned. So Graduate Recom International, Grin has already uh, established and we have been doing this for the past couple of uh, years. So you can like being an international student, connect to other international students who have already been over here in this community. That might help you understand what their process was maybe they would have um, they had gone through the same stage that you are going same challenges so that can be really really helpful and again this is not the only option your department might also have like some uh, uh, mentorship program like in our mechanical department they also do this uh, mentoring program so you not only have the outside of academic mentorship program but also you could have or you might already have some academic related mentorship program as well and as um, Vipa was mentioning that, feel free to connect with your lab seniors if you're working in any lab. If you're not even working in any lab, just find some random senior or like just find some random person and then ask them. If not, just go to the coordinator or the, like the staff uh, in your department. They are really helpful. They're super helpful. They have been over here helping the students. So they are experienced in helping you. So they would know a lot more and at least you will know like at least one more thing uh, about the resources availability. Yeah, I know when I was a new graduate student and I'm just putting this in the chat, um, something Mohammed pointed out is there are also staff in your departments that are, their job is to help you navigate the resources and find the support that you need. Typically their title is something like graduate coordinator. Um, you've likely, encountered this person already, whether it's emailing about your admissions or, um, you know, logistical things related to orientation, but they are supposed to be doing a lot more than just pointing you to orientation. Um, so that's someone, if you, again, don't have a peer mentor yet, and you're feeling really socially isolated, um, just like Mohammed said, taking one step and talking to one person, that might be a great person to start with um, since they are, they're not grading your work. They're not evaluating you. They really are the person in your department or program that's identified to help support graduate students, um, you know, in finding resources and getting connected to research and things like that. So, um, with that, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions from our attendees. You can feel free to use the chat to ask questions of Viba and Mohammed. Um, so either put your questions in the chat or folks, if you're comfortable, you can unmute um, and just share out your question verbally. So either way, how do students get a peer mentor with Grin? Yeah, do, do either of you wanna share a little bit more about how to get connected to that program? Yeah, I mean, uh, we already like are and have been sending emails to the new uh, students uh, about various uh, opportunities and events and like, et cetera, that we organize. So if you have not already received that email, we can like, uh, I'll just copy and paste the form over here. And yeah, Laura has already shared the website. So you can easily go over there, reach out to any person. You can also email me, I can leave over here and then I can personally share the program details with you. It's just a like simple form uh, asking about your program and background information and that should be it. And we'll be able to like peer with you with some uh, already mentor program. So yeah, just reach out to the green uh, at umich.edu and just shoot out a simple email that hey, please send us information. And I can uh, also like, meanwhile, uh, we're talking, I can also like pull out the form link and send it over here. Yeah, that would be great. Any other questions? I always say the Zoom silence is more silent than regular silence. Um, oh yes, look, we have a grad coordinator here. So <laughs> see, Nicole is making sure that she knows how to support you all um, in her program. Any uh, other? Hello? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a, I, can I just tell my, 
uh, you know, challenges and share with you guys and see that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can get some help. Yeah, go ahead, share. Yeah, uh, firstly, I'm a student, a first year master's student in biostatistics. And um, um, I'm an international student from China and I don't have any experience in, you know, to study abroad. So I think the most challenging part firstly is to understand what the teacher are saying in the lecture, you know. Um, I don't have the experience to listen to a maybe two hours lecture. Uh, and the whole time the teacher is just um, uh, give, giving our, uh, give our information on some knowledge. So it is firstly the challenging part. And secondly, I think that I am struggling with my homework, but um, it's not that hard, but, but it's very challenging to know what the teacher or the instructors really want you to do in your assignment. Yeah, so I don't know their uh, exper uh, their ex uh, expectations for us uh, and how we will going to finish our assignments. And um, above that academic uh, parts, I think there is also changing, although our department has a lot of uh, you know, students in my, from my country, but it's, um, it started to be competitive a mom, you know, apply for a PhD or get a new job or something that we will face in the future. So it's very, it is a little bit tension here and everybody just want to, you know, get their road clearly be, uh, behind of them. So I think it made me a little bit stressful at this time, but um, luckily that these two uh, students they share about how to, you know, about worrying wellness and that caps thing. I think maybe I will try them and, uh, you know, just find my inner peace. <laughs> Regardless yeah, of that stress. sounds very stressful. I just want to name it sounds like, yeah, you're navigating like just the exhaustion of um, like being in an English language context full time for the first time, like not having done this study abroad um, and, you know, maybe feeling like it's highly competitive with your peers where it feels less comfortable um, connecting to peers in your home program. And on top of all of that, not being sure what the expectations are around assignments. Um, Viva or Mohammed, do you have anything you want to say, I have a thought on a resource, but I think you two are experts even more than me. So I'll let you share first. Uh, can I say something? Oh, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so hi, everybody. My name is Andres. I'm also a first year PhD student in uh, biological chemistry. And um, I, I, I have the same feeling that the girl who was talking before to me. So I was a little bit insecure about my uh, listening ability during my classes. So something that I have been using is the, this uh, resource that I put in the chat, which basically uh, when the professor is talking, it's going to do the transcript for, for the class. So after class, you can check that. That is something that I have been using during these two weeks because I was kind of insecure about my listening. So uh, when the professor is talking, uh, it is doing the transcripts and you're going to have access to the audio and also the transcripts there. So you need to use just your computer and actually using your uh, email address from the university, you're just going to have access to almost six hours of uh, recording. So you can use that to get the transcript and then you can study after class. That's something that I have been using because I have the same feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So maybe, yeah, specifically on just linguistic adjustment, do either of you have thoughts related to that, Viva or Mohammed? Um, first of all, Andres, uh, thank you so much for this resource, even like I did not know that. So thanks for that. But the thing that I found helpful is reaching out to professor or the instructor, whoever you're in the class with, 
just telling them know what the issues are that you have been facing, be it just linguistic or simply you don't understand or follow the material. More likely than not, they would definitely do something, make some arrangements to help you. They can probably provide you the detailed description of what they are going to speak, what they are going to talk, maybe also share with you their slides with the notes in it, if there anything. Uh, that's like, that was only in one resource that I could think of, like just reaching out to them and then letting them know that, hey, I have been sitting over here in class for the past two weeks, but I haven't been following much of it. I simply do not understand. So maybe if you could try to speak slowly, if they have been speaking fast or like this different thing or anything that they could accommodate you with, uh, they can, most likely they would do that. Yeah, I was also going to suggest reaching out to the professor because they're usually very um, responsive to like, they want to know, like if someone is having any kind of trouble or struggle in their class, they want to know it so that they can help. Um, I mean, sometimes some professors like don't care as much, which is always, you know, it's not a good feeling when you come across that. Um, but I noticed that like sometimes um, taking a fewer number of classes can also be helpful as you're transitioning, especially because you have to like, you know, adjust to a new culture and kind of deal with like the mental load of that. So I think eight is the minimum amount of credits that you need to be enrolled, isn't it? Like you need to be full time. So if you can take like just the amount of credits you need to be full time, maybe like, you know, to find ways to reduce like your academic load sometimes can be helpful as you're like navigating the early stages. I know I've always taken like with undergrad or any grad level, I've the first semester I've all, all, always taken like um, very little just because I wanted to um, involve myself more in like my lab or like other activities so I can like transition better. Yeah, I would add one last resource that you may already know about, but the English Language Institute um, is a resource for all students, even though some folks often see like, oh, it says LSNA and I'm in biostats, like I, I do I have access to that? And you do have access to it and they have lots of different programs from like workshops to conversation circles. So the conversation circles is one that again is just having informal conversations with someone who's not in your program, who really cares about international students and just helping them with their speaking and listening. Um, and it's kind of a safe space to do a little bit more of that language immersion. So I put a link to their website in the chat too, so you could um, you know, reach out and see what, they even have academic um, advisors there, like ELI Academic Advising, it kind of has a link on the main page. You could ask to meet with one of their advisors and just say, you know, my time's extremely limited. I'm a master's student. What are, what like one or two things might be helpful for me related to just getting acclimated to listening for hours to like advanced <laughs> um, because it's in your academic discipline too. So there might be, you know, highly advanced specialized jargon and terminology that some of the domestic students also aren't familiar with. So I would just name that like academic jargon is very different from um, conversational English. And that um, is normal, a normal academic challenge to adjust to. Um, and I, I do think um, one thing I wanted to emphasize that both Biba and Muhammad said is being able to talk to the faculty members. So what I heard about the expectations for assignments being unclear, um, look at when the office hours are um, for the course where you're feeling unclear about the expectations and you can go to that faculty member's office during those hours. Sometimes students think like, oh, if I go to office hours, that's a sign that I don't know what's going on and I'm, I'm not smart. That's not what it is at all. It exists because many students need clarification and um, need to, to ask questions of the faculty member. And that's why all faculty set aside a period of time where you can come in and ask those questions one-on-one -on -one outside of class. So I would encourage you to take advantage of those office hours that is very, 
um, normal in United States higher education and often folks who maybe their faculty in their home country didn't do office hours or even you know folks in the US who are coming from public schools where teachers didn't do one on one appointments with students. Um, may not realize that that's normal and good to go to those office hours and say, hey, we have this problem set and I'm really unclear on how this is being evaluated and, you know, just bring that question in that safe space where you can during office hours. Um, yeah, these are great questions. Did that answer your question, Yidan? Yes, okay. Um, other questions that folks might have. Oh, interested in someone's interest in the recreational resource that you talked about, Viva. Do you want to say more about that? Uh, yeah, I'll drop the link for it after I, I finish talking. Um, so I believe you can rent uh, bikes or um, kayaks or like. I think it's it's like you have hourly rentals and I think you also have like every, um, you can rent them per day. Um, I've been interested in renting bikes um, just to like get around campus. Um, and um, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, so th th that's like one spot that I know on campus like recreation um, uh, rentals, but like, if you want to go kayaking, you can also go to the Gallup Park or as some of the parks in the city um, and they have like paid rentals um, that are very, I think, accessible. Um, and like if you want to explore like more of, um, yeah, I think someone dropped the, the chat for it, the link for it. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so like even if you are interested in like um, the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, is very beautiful if you love outdoor, um, being in nature. Um, and just like there's parts of Michigan that have really good like beaches or um, outdoor like um, hiking spots. So I would just, um, and Laura also dropped another <laughs> link for it. So you can definitely like, especially the A2 um, Gov page has all like listing of all like all the parks and recreational um, spots around campus. Yeah, I think um, there's just so many <laughs> Um, like from the hyper local, this rec sports link um, to what's available in Ann Arbor to what both Viva and Mohammed put in the chat, like Michigan as a state has um, a really amazing state parks system. Um, so I, I can look up to the state parks information. Um, I find like the state parks, if you don't have a vehicle, that might be like a little more challenging to access, but kind of connecting with friends who might have a vehicle or renting something um, for to do something on the weekend. Just over this past weekend, I was in Holland, Michigan with my husband celebrating our anniversary and I fell asleep on the beach, which was awesome. So and when I was a new grad student, I didn't go to West Michigan until my fifth year of graduate school. And I didn't even know that there were beaches in Michigan. So I wish someone had told me. Actually, yeah, Holland also has a tulip festival, usually I think in um, midsummer, which is really pretty if if that's something, you know, people like to see. Um, and also I would suggest like, there's a lot of winter activities to do um, in, in the winter months. Um, and I think from the rentals that I mentioned, you can also um, rent skis and snowshoes. So, um, another popular thing that I, I didn't know this was a thing. It's like, um, you know, that thing where you walk in snow with the, the skis, it's just walking. Like the snowshoeing, is that what you're referring to, Viva? Yeah, I, 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 I can't remember the name of like the activity right now. Yeah, I think it's snowshoeing. Yeah, so it, it, I mean, that's really fun. I, I was like, oh, we're just walking. But, you know, I would definitely encourage um, people to like go out in the winter, especially with like, you know, how, um, how like seasonal depression can set in. Like, it's really, it's really helpful if you can keep yourself active and outdoors. 
Yeah, I noticed a follow up question in the chat about are there any sources for brand new international students to explore Ann Arbor, like the city, local food attractions, local community sharing, similar backgrounds, et cetera. I think um, I mentioned earlier the grad school 101 um, site, and there is a page on there. Um, I'm, I'm clicking back to make sure. I find the, the correct, um, but there's a link in that course that you all as new students should have access to. It's called the Ann Arbor Community. And there's, um, you can just kind of click through and see all the resources there related to exploring the, the wider community. Um, I don't know, Viva or Mohammed, if you have kind of just broadly good resources for people looking to explore Ann Arbor, more just the city and getting to learn more about the community and what's available. Uh, so what I did when I came over here, because I had like not so many friends, well, a few from community, so asking them was really helpful if they have been around over here for a while. And then I just went to like the city of Ann Arbor website. They have a lot of resources and good recommendations. Like I got to know about the parks over there, about the kayaking activities and so many other things that I did not know that even like my few of the seniors did not know existed. So do check that out, I would say. And again, maybe ask uh, other people who have been around over here. And also like uh, we've mentioned about the Tulip Festival. So there's like Nichols Arboretum over here. They also have like a pony garden over there, so it kind of blooms and I guess in May or April somewhere. So that also like kind of good outdoorsy excursion activity if you're just feeling tired so and just want to have a walk over there and see some beautiful flowers. So it's a free uh, entrance for everybody. And regarding one thing I had been like holding up was that getting around in Ann Arbor. Yeah, definitely out of Ann Arbor, you might need some um, a car or something like that but there's a greyhound that can take you probably a few of the places and within Ann Arbor make sure that you can use the the ride the city buses they're completely free for you you just have to swipe m card and they can take you pretty much almost uh, all over the uh, city of the Ann Arbor they can take you to Gallup Park Argo Park these are like two famous parks and outdoors activities in Ann Arbor Um, I would also recommend joining like your local departmental organization. So for example, I'm part of uh, Gradsui, which is the Graduate Society of Women Engineers, um, which it, it's more the engineering um, for engineering graduate students. So we do like events like apple picking and like, um, you know, skating, ice skating and stuff like that. So sometimes uh, being part of those organizations, you get like free access to like go do stuff and you know you get sometimes uh, they feed you and you know it's like a great place to meet people so I would su suggest checking out like you know organizations in your program um, and like more like department specific and I I'm, I'm trying to look for a link which I have saved and it has like all the resources for um winter supplies so i'm gonna go i'm i'm gonna look for that if someone else wants to answer that the next question yeah mohammed while while viva looks for that link someone was just concerned about like what do i for people who haven't lived in a really cold place like this what are some winter essentials uh, yeah so i attended this one i'm attending this one class in environment and sustainability and one of the class was just all about getting the resources around here and somebody just mentioned oh i went to a store to get the winter jacket and it was thousand dollars so i'm not going to get that so yeah don't feel like get overwhelmed about that the key tricks over here that i have um, learned and generally everybody would recommend probably is just layering yourself up because like in the, if you have already noticed uh, that within the construction buildings, you might not feel that hot or that cold. Only if you feel like go outside, you would feel like this intense winters. So layering can help you prepare for that. Just wear like two, one or two layers. And if it's too cold outside, you can wear another. If it is not that cold inside, you can just easily take it off. 
And for buying the stuff, I would say like, you don't really have to go to the super expensive stores. There are places uh, around like, uh, I found Old Navy. Uh, there are like two different stores around here. I found like winter coat for like, I guess 50 or 60 bucks. So I didn't have to pay for like thousand uh, bucks over here. So do try to that. There are some other stores like TJ Maxx. You might not have a huge variety over there, but you can definitely find good and cheaper stuff over there. So they're like, they also have two branches. So whichever is convenient and easy for you, just take the ride or the city bus over there. Uh, yeah, I mentioned Old Navy, TJ Maxx. There is Briarwood Mall as well, but that might be a bit like, uh, uh, could get possibly a bit expensive or not. So that's that. And yeah, there are other stores as well, like Marshalls, I guess, around here that you can probably check. But yeah, buying multiple layers, layering yourself would kind of like help you instead of just spending exuberant amount on just like one winter coat, which you might only be needing for like, I guess, one or two months, like which are the peak winters. So layering would definitely help you go through the longest period of the winters over here from October to like all the way till April or May. Viva, do you, do you have additional thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so sad I couldn't find the Google Doc. So it's literally like a bunch of students that came together and put together a Google Doc of like the do's and don'ts. But I did find a good resource from the University Health Center that um, talks about winter survival tips. And I would say like people, you know, are will tell you it's terrible. It's so cold. And while that's all true, you you can you'll be fine. Like, you know, you'll be able to make it. So I wouldn't you know, worry about like, uh, worry or stress about it. Um, like Muhammad said, like definitely layering helps a lot. And I think it took me almost two years to learn that. So definitely layer, your life will change. Um, and I think having a good pair of shoes is important, is what I've noticed is more important than having a good jacket because um, there's like about a week or two where it, it'll be, it'll be snowing a lot. So you have to probably trudge through the snow um, or like icy sidewalks. <laughs> so I would just be careful with when the sidewalks are icy because that's more that's worse than um, actual snow. Um, so if you're not used to walking on ice, uh, you might slip and that's not those can injuries can be nasty. So just like walking slowly and having good heels that have a good traction is really important. Good uh, shoes that have traction is really important. So I know Muhammad has to step out just a couple minutes early. So as he's doing that, I just wanted to thank him because this has been so great to hear from two experienced students. So I know, um, speaking of walk time, <laughs> Muhammad needs some walk time to get to his next appointment at 10 a.m. So thank you, Muhammad. And um, I know Viva has probably time for one other question if folks have another question um for our panelists bye mohammed uh thank you so much it was great meeting you uh if uh, people need i can leave my email address over here just to uh, them to seek any help that i could probably help with that so i'm just leaving my email over here feel free to reach out to me from green or personal or department or whatever i could help and i would be happy to do that and thanks again for having me it was really great meeting you all bye bye any final question that we have? This website from UHS is great, <laughs> actually. Um, because yeah, I don't know how many parents we have, but um, there's some good comments in there too about how public school closures work if there's like weather. Um, I I'll note that it's very rare, but it does happen that the university might shut down due to inclement weather. Um, I would say maybe that's happened once per year at most during my whole um, almost 20 years, my gosh, in Ann Arbor now. So um, it's very rare, but it does happen just so folks know that if it's incredibly icy or unsafe, the university itself might also shut down. Um, um, one thing I wanna add is, um, figure out your attack situation um 
because even as international students, you might have like, you know, tax obligations, uh, federal and at the state level. So um, there's usually workshops that happen around this time and around tax um, the year, which is like in March or April. I, I always forget the month. Yeah, um, they're due in yeah. April. So usually folks prepare them in March. And we did just have a workshop on this on September 1, but we recorded it much like we're recording our session right now. So um, that recording will be posted on the Grad School 101 page that again, folks should have access to on your Canvas because um, yeah, being in a new country and understanding tax obligations is can be very stressful and we know that. And so we do offer twice a year, a workshop specifically related to taxes with someone who's a tax expert at the graduate school. Um, so keep an eye out for either that workshop or the video of the workshop, even if um, you couldn't attend. Yeah, yeah, so that's kind of a parting piece of wisdom. Any other parting wisdom, Biba? I don't see any new questions in the chat. Um, I think, yeah, just like keep making sure that, you know, you are checking the International Center website periodically for any like related announcements. Um, and I think they also have good resources with like for current students and like incoming students and like different, even for J1 students. So I, I always reach out to the International Center if I have any question, even if it's like the slightest, like, even if it's the like very, you know, small um, and feels like I'm bugging them, but I, I just like ask the question. So definitely feel free to reach out to them if you have any like questions with I-20 or your status and stuff. Yeah, I'm so glad. I can't believe International Center hasn't come up and probably all of you just getting here know that it exists, but um, they do have really lovely kind of informational sessions, international coffee hours. So again, um, if you're just feeling like you don't know who to ask something to, the international coffee hours that I think they have weekly is yet another place where they'll just be an expert there, a staff member who understands the challenges that international students and scholars face and can point you at least in the right direction and just be a safe space to um, drink coffee. I, I suspect they're all virtual, but <laughs> drink your coffee or tea in your own space. And, um, oh, it looks like, no, they're holding them outdoors. I'm looking at the one that's next week. So, um, that's another great resource for, um, international students. And they aren't just a resource for visa questions, just like Viva said, any question you can go to them and they'll at least point you in the right direction. So um, hopefully this session was helpful for everyone today. Um, glad so many of you were able to join us. And I want to, again, we already thank Mohammed, but I want to thank Viva. Um, she also helped us identify another panelist for the session and kind of co-planned it with us. So she really was a collaborator um, in the session. Yes, I'll add a link to the Grad School 101 in the chat. Um, and if anyone is not able to access Grad School 101, um, I please email me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat and I'll pass it along to my colleague, Paul Artale, who um, created Grad School 101. He got the data from um, our registrar's office for who should, who should have access to the course. So it may be due to a glitch in the registrar data that um, some of our incoming students didn't get access. So email me if you log into your Canvas and you don't see something that says Grad School 101 and I will get you access. Thank you everyone.